Over the past week, the U.S. Coast Guard's investigation into the tragic Titan submersible implosion has revealed several new updates. In this video, I will cover key findings, including surprising business practices, footage of the wreckage recovery, and first-hand accounts from individuals connected to OceanGate, the company behind the Titan. And most importantly, that got them out of the U.S. Coast Guard doing certification and inspections on the vessel, and that was the big issue. What Stockton Rush did not want to do was slow down the development of the submersible and stop money from flowing in to keep the company afloat. There are some new intense photos of the Titan submersible that show the different subparts lying on the ocean floor. The brand new pictures perfectly complement a video that was actually released by the Coast Guard earlier in the hearings, which shows a large chunk of the submersible intact with several wires laying out on the ocean floor. The image, shown by the U.S. Coast Guard on September 16th, reveals the sub's tail cone embedded in the seabed for more than 12,000 feet below the surface. It was captured by a remote-operated vehicle, and the photo provided what officials called conclusive evidence of the catastrophic implosion that killed all five passengers. It's actually crazy how we finally see what the wreckage looks like. So many people thought that it just completely turned into gel or some sort of liquid. According to the Coast Guard, the Pelagic Rescue Service's 6000 ROV discovered the tail cone and other debris on June 22, 2023, which is four days after Titan lost contact during its dive. They also had additional video that was just released. It was held on by the Coast Guard for all this time. And now we get to see a closer look at the remaining wreckage, showing the sub's dome, the aftering, some of the hull parts, and the carbon fiber fragments scattered on the ocean floor. It's really interesting just to see all this information that the Coast Guard's been holding on to for over a year. One of the first new shocking facts released was that OceanGate used a hand-entered Excel spreadsheet to track the Titan submersible during its dive. And Atella Wilby, a former contractor for OceanGate, explained that the sub's navigation relied on manually entering coordinates into the spreadsheet. And she said that there were delays because they had to write down the lat-long coordinates and then type them in. And Atella shared during her testimony that they aimed to update the location every five minutes, but it was a ton of work, and sometimes they got it wrong because of human error. She called the system absolutely idiotic, adding that when she raised concerns, she was just brushed off and told that she was not being solution-oriented. Other former employees have also raised safety concerns. Tony Nissen, the former director of engineering at OceanGate, testified last week that he refused to participate in a test dive with the sub. The investigation into the Titan disaster is ongoing, with live hearings streamed on the U.S. Coast Guard's YouTube channel throughout the rest of this week as well. There's actually an animation that recreates the incident, which was released last week. And it depicted the sub losing communication at a depth of 3,346 meters. So I have a little bit of that to show you here, but we're going to jump into one of the next major points of the investigation. So it turns out the submersible had a troubled history long before it actually imploded. On day one of the investigation, it was revealed that the sub had experienced numerous equipment issues. In 2021 alone, there were 70 documented problems, followed by 48 in 2022. These issues raised serious concerns about the safety and reliability of the vessel. Concerns that were tragically validated during its final mission. Everyone who said that there is massive problems with the Titan sub was actually right. One of the more startling revelations from the investigation was that during the long winter leading up to the fatal dive, the Titan was stored outside in freezing temperatures in Newfoundland without any protection from the elements. This negligence likely exacerbated the vessel's structural weakness. Less than a month before the dive, the sub was tested, but just two days later it was found to be partially sunk after a night of rough seas and fog. This thing was barely held together. The fact that they took it all the way down to the Titanic is just mind-blowing. There were signs of trouble even in the days leading up to the dive. Just before the sub's final mission, five passengers were reportedly slammed against the vessel's walls as it resurfaced from a previous dive. The incidents paint a picture of a vessel plagued with so many problems, and they were just all ignored and downplayed by those in charge. The hearing in South Carolina on Monday aimed to shed light on these issues. 
Tony Nissen, the former engineer director at Ocean Gate, was visibly shaken when he saw the Coast Guard's presentation. And Tony described the long list of issues that the sub had that he was screaming from the top of his lungs about. He called the problems disturbing and pointed to them as clear indicators that the Titan was not safe for deep sea exploration. Tony's testimony was particularly damning. He explained that he had been fired from Ocean Gate in 2019 after refusing to approve a Titanic expedition that year, citing concerns about the Titan's haul. According to Tony, Oceangate lied about the reason for the cancellation, blaming it on issues with the support ship the Polar Prince, when in reality, they didn't have a haul. He also recounted a 2018 incident when the Titan was struck by lightning during testing in the Bahamas. Despite Tony's warnings that the strike may have compromised the haul, Stockton Rush, Oceangate's CEO and the man who designed the Titan himself, brushed off the concerns with a casual it'll be okay. Throughout the hearing, it became clear that Ocean Gate's leadership had repeatedly ignored warning and safety concerns. When asked why the company had not made any effort at all to comply with regulatory or certification standards, Tony revealed that there had been little interest in doing so. There was no desire by Stockton Rush to do it, Tony said. This lack of compliance with established safety guidelines was probably just a cost-cutting measure but it ultimately proved fatal. Another former OceanGate employee, Bonnie Carl, took the stand to share her own concerns about the company's approach to safety. Carl, who had been the company's finance director, left her position in February 2018 due to an alarming lack of oversight that she witnessed. She described young engineers in their later early 20s working unsupervised on the sub, just kind of doing whatever they felt was working which raised red flags about the company's commitment to safety. She said that it became abundantly clear to her that OceanGate was not the place that she wanted to work, if that was their attitude towards safety. The testimony from Tony and Carl painted a picture of a company that was cutting corners and ignoring expert advice, with devastating consequences. Despite the mounting concerns, the crew aboard the Titan during its final dive had no indication of the imminent danger they were in. According to the investigation's report, the crew sent no messages indicating trouble or emergency during their descent. The last communication from the Titan was a message stating that they had dropped two weights, likely to help the sub descend more easily. The message sent shortly before the sub imploded initially led some to believe that the crew was aware of the danger and attempting an emergency ascent. However, Tim Catterson, a contractor who had helped launch the sub on the day of the disaster clarified that dropping the weights was a standard maneuver to slow the vessel's landing, not an attempt to resurface. The crew was never heard from again after that final message. At the time, the Titan was more than two miles below the surface of the Atlantic. Thirty minutes earlier, they had sent a message reassuring the support ship that everything was quote all good here. The mystery of what exactly caused the Titan to implode has remained the focus of the Coast Guard's investigation. They're trying to get down to the very nitty gritty of what actually happened, and this has been going on for over a year. Interestingly, some key figures and experts associated with the Titan and Ocean Gate are not on the witness list, raising concerns about the thoroughness of the investigation. Alfred S. McLaren, a retired Navy submariner and submersible pilot, questioned the omission of more recent Ocean Gate officials from the hearings. Where are the other experts? McLaren asked, pointing out that while the Coast Guard board can continue its investigation privately and schedule additional public hearings, the absence of key witnesses could undermine the credibility of the final project. Since the accident, experts have scrutinized some of the design choices that set the Titan apart from other deep-sea vessels. One notable departure from industry standards was the Titan's pill-like shape. Most submersibles used for deep dives are spherical, which offers better structural integrity under pressure. Another thing that was brought up in the investigation was that OceanGate allegedly sidestepped federal regulations by giving passengers official-sounding job titles. OceanGate, which charged passengers six-figure fees to dive to the Titanic wreck in its experimental Titan vessel, called them mission specialists, 
However, according to testimony, those roles were far from specialized. In reality, most specialists did tasks like holding wrenches and counting fish during the dive. It was clearly a way to dodge U.S. regulations for passengers, testified Carl Stanley, who operates Stanley Submersibles in Honduras. Stanley explained that during the sixth day of the Coast Guard hearings, where both he and former Ocean Gate employee Amber Bay shared their experiences with the company's operations. Bay confirmed that passengers on the deep sea dives weren't just tourists. They were labeled as mission specialists and tasked with the routine jobs that help keep the operation running. However, when the board questioned her about whether these mission specialists were compensated, had shares in the company, or received benefits, Bay clarified that they had actually paid to be part of the mission. During his testimony on Monday, OceanGate co-founder Guillermo Schoenlein explained that submersibles fall into three categories. Recreational subs for non-paying guests, passenger subs for paying customers, and research vessels carrying owners, crew, and researchers. OceanGate wanted to avoid the stricter regulations tied to passenger vessels, which drove the company to consider various ways to classify its clients differently. One idea was to offer customers shares in the company so that they can be considered part owners, but that idea was quickly scrapped. Another suggestion was to pay passengers a dollar so that they could be classified as crew. They also explored calling the sub a research vessel, which had a broader definition and could technically include trainees or assistants. Stanley pointed out that the mission specialist title was part of this strategy to bypass regulations. He recalled his own dive to 12,000 feet aboard an early version of the Titan after OceanGate CEO Stockton Rush completed a solo dive. Before this descent, Rush warned the crew about potential loud noises, which Stanley later realized came from the experimental carbon fiber hull cracking under pressure. The cracking sounds would get louder the deeper we went, explaining that it was a clear indication of their depth, even when they couldn't tell when the sub was descending. OceanGate's legal counsel questioned Stanley about the company's safety practices, asking when Rush became aware of the hull's flaws but Stanley couldn't provide an exact answer. Meanwhile, Renata Rojas, a self-professed Titanic enthusiast, defended OceanGate during her testimony. She had participated in a 2022 mission as a mission specialist and compared Rush to Neil Armstrong. However, she was candid about her role on the dive, admitting that she was just standing around until someone needed help. Rush insisted on doing the Titan sub's first crewed test dive alone, just in case anything went wrong, according to Guillermo Schoenlein. Guillermo testified on September 23rd that Rush told him, I don't want anybody else to be on the sub for the first dive to 4,000 meters. If anything happens, I want it to only impact me. Schoenlein recalled Rush saying, It's my design, I believe in it, I trust in it, and I don't want to risk anyone else. I'm going myself. Rush also faced direct criticism for the dangers of his work. During a 2018 meeting with David Lockridge, OceanGate's former operations director, Rush was challenged about safety concerns. According to a transcript from that meeting, Rush responded, I have no desire to die. I understand the risks, and I'm going into it with my eyes open, and I think it's one of the safest things I'll ever do. Around two dozen witnesses are lined up to testify during the two-week hearing. The first person to take the stand was Tony Nissen, and he came in pretty hot with a lot of allegations. When asked whether he felt comfortable piloting the Titan on the Titanic mission, Tony admitted that he wasn't at ease with the idea. In fact, Stockton Rush had asked him to be the pilot for those expeditions, but Tony flat out told him, I'm not doing it, I'm not getting in there. Rush then pressed him for an explanation, saying, what do you mean you're not going to pilot it? This is your job. And Tony said, because I just don't trust the operations crew. Rush then asked, what if I'm the mission director? But Tony's reply didn't change, because he said, you still have the same operations crew and I don't trust you. He added that his mistrust also extended to Rush himself. Nothing that I was told when I was hired turned out to be true. All they did was lie. Another witness, Tim Catterson, echoed Tony's concerns about the sub's safety. 
Catterson said he wouldn't have felt confident diving to the depths of the Titanic in the Titan either. His concerns centered around the materials used in the sub's construction, specifically the combination of carbon fiber and titanium. I don't believe the composites are the right material for a pressure vessel dealing with external compression, he said adding that he had definite doubts about the sub's ability to withstand the intense pressure at depth. Catterson testified that he wasn't quiet about his concerns. He had voiced them multiple times to Rush, Tony, and David Lockridge, but no one listened. In fact, he said that he raised the issue of the carbon fiber hall's integrity with Rush no less than half a dozen times. He just kept telling him over and over and over again that this was not going to work, but Rush did not care. Catterson believed that the sub was underbuilt, but Rush dismissed his worries, saying I have several engineers working on this, and they say otherwise. Bonnie Carl backed up all of Tim Catterson's and Tony's testimony. Well, I think in the case of Ocean Gate, there are a lot of warnings, and that's something we're hearing a lot of. There were so many red flags that were being drawn up. The problem you had with Ocean Gate was all those red flags went to Stockton Rush, the CEO. They were, there was nowhere to go above him. And what they really needed was an agency or an organization that they could go to. They should have been able to go to an organization like the Coast Guard to intercede. I think in the past, we've seen submersibles with new technologies come in. I think we're going to continue to see new technologies. They're continually pushing the envelope. But this is an industry that safety is paramount. There is no margin for error, as we saw with the failure of Titan. 